My story is about redefining the way we think about research for innovation. And why would we do that? I've actually made a career out of research for innovation, but I have found myself many times not wanting to describe what I do as research. And that's because research, it's been mentioned today, traditional research anyway, doesn't necessarily sit very well with innovation a lot of the time. Sometimes it's quite rearward facing and doesn't come up with anything new. Sometimes doing research is an excuse for not doing anything else. And uh, I think we probably all can think of promising ideas that got killed by research before they really had a chance to grow. So um, that's as it may be, but I haven't made a career of it. I love research, and I really think it's got a very important role to play in innovation. So my story is in three parts. I'm going to tell a little about my personal journey, which led me to have to redefine research for myself, and then tell a few stories about how that has played out in practice, and then talk just a little about where I'd love to see it go in the future. So my personal story. I grew up in an artistic family. This is a painting of me as a child about six by my dad. It's a fairly imaginative interpretation, I think you'll agree. But it is based on reality. I stood posing for this with a big bucket of water for some amount of time, based on reality. Anyway, I uh, had a wonderful childhood growing up in a very creative, imaginative environment. When it time to, came time for me to go to college, I was really seeking more structure, some more rationality. So um, notice the equal spacing here. <laughs> I, uh, above, above all, was interested in what drives people to do what they do? What are the motivations and perceptions that people have? There is order, there is structure. So um, I wanted to understand this. I thought we could design better things in the world if we understood people better. I still believe that. And I, I went and got a human science degree and I learned how to do research. I learned how to look carefully. I learned how to log data. I learned how to analyze it and make beautiful graphs like this. I got a job in a research company. Um, this was my first project that was exploring ways to make motorcycles more visible and led to the daytime lights you see on vehicles today. And it was great applying research to be able to improve the situation, to make things better. I did lots of projects of that kind. I measured uh, flow rates of passengers through transit stations to make better ticket barriers. I ran focus groups and interviewed residents of old tenement housing in Scotland to make them into better, more livable places. And I did lots of user studies with power tools. You'll see here the front hand. This man is actually not holding the handle of the chainsaw. He's holding the guard. So I worked with Black & Decker on their next version of a chainsaw where the handle looked like a handle and the guard worked like a guard. And uh, it was wonderful to be, as I said, applying research to this making things better. Then one day, a client from a kitchen appliance company came in, and he was not looking for a better toaster. He said, Jane, you know a lot now about design for people and, um, and doing research. I would like you to do a research project with me on the kitchen of the future. And I, I just went, oh, you know, I know a lot about how to make a better toaster, dishwasher, kitchen sink, but kitchen of the future? I actually don't think I have the tools in my research kit to help you with that kind of radical innovation, to be thinking forward to things that don't exist yet. I, you know, I think you should go to a design company because I think they'd have more imagination and they'd have, be able to paint you a vision of what the future might look like. So um, off he went. And that was a turning point for me because I realized, hey, you know, I want to be part of that. I want to apply my research skills and understanding of people to the design of new things that come into the world, not just, valid though it is, incremental improvements of things that already exist. So I followed my own advice and joined IDEO. And uh, for a while, 
I really struggled and I really thought I didn't know how to do research in this forward-thinking way. And eventually, I realized, no, I do have the tools. Actually, we all have the tools. What I realized was that research, in its essence, is about going out into the world, looking at reality, and making sense of it. But instead of just what I'd learned to do, measure it, treat it as data, why not let it inspire our empathy? Why not let it spark our imagination? That way, we can think of all kinds of new possibilities. Look at, this, look, look at these situations. If we ask ourselves and try to empathize with what's going on here, what's the experience these people are having in the kitchen? What is their source of enjoyment? What, what does it feel like for them? If we, if we look at the evidence and let it talk to our empathy and imagination, we can imagine all kinds of new possibilities, like the kitchen as a family learning lab for children, or the kitchen as a, a cockpit of controls for the hobbyist chef. It's a question of not just looking at what's literally what's happening, but really looking for patterns and themes that take us into thinking about possibilities for the future. And that's what I mean about redefining research for innovation. What I realized was then that I needed to expand my definition of what research was. I'd been really, really well schooled in the idea, the tradition of research as data. But if we think about innovation, we, th we start to think about the future. Then we start to invoke our intuitive capabilities, empathy, imagination, interpretation. And those, those blended with rational thinking create a whole new sort of paradigm for research, which is where I ended up. Empathy and imagination are wonderful. We all have it. We use it all the time. But it can also run riot. So it's at its best, I think, when it's combined, when it's continually informed and inspired by reality. So that was my personal discovery of, of a need to redefine research for myself. And I'd like to share a few stories about how that's played out. So first, a simple innovation story where observation, empathy, and, and, and inspiration really, um, really were crucial. This was for IKEA. Traditional research might start here, perhaps, with a, might start here and end with a PowerPoint with charts and diagrams about what, how high children can reach, the kind of things they need to store, um, what colors they like. But if we actually look at children and where they spend their time, we realize they have a very different kind of relationship with space and furniture than adults do. And how might we empathize more with that? Here's Graham, the designer, getting empathic and um, being inspired by a child's point of view. And here's his solution. What do you think? Oh, this is how it works. Sweet. Second is a little more complex of a challenge. This is innovation in consumer banking. Um, again, the insight didn't come from focus groups and surveys. It, it came from observation, empathy, imagination. Um, our clients from Bank of America worked with us on this project. We went and visited people, learned about how they use money, how they think about it generally. And here we are making sense of what we've seen. In this kind of research, we can't just hand over a deck with research results and recommendations and expect something to happen. It really takes being engaged with the evidence, looking for patterns, looking for themes, making sense of what we see, um, being inspired like as we were here. And here's some of the crucial evidence. We saw lots of people rounding up, and this woman in particular Every time she pays her utility bill, she rounds up. And she does that out of a sense of wanting to be in control, stay in control of her financial situation. As it's kind of a way of saving. It's a way of building credit with the company so she's never caught short. And that empathic insight was what led to the idea for Keep the Change, which is the debit card that helps you save. Every time you use this card, it rounds up and puts the money in your savings account. 
it's a really sweet alignment between customer's desire to save and the bank's desire to have you keep using the card. And uh, since they launched it about a year ago, they've opened um, a million, over a million savings accounts. So that paid off. Um, and my last example is one where actually a whole hospital participated in the research. And I mean doctors, nurses, patients to auxiliaries and administrators, all were part of this. The first step was to get the people who work in the hospital to understand, so what is the patient experience? And um, the most powerful thing we did was make this video, a video, this video, of um, a day in the life through the eyes of a patient. And what does that look like? Well, 80% of it looks like this. <laughs> really, imagine showing this to doctors. I mean, the people who work in these hospitals where they have all the state-of-the-art equipment, and this is the experience that many of their patients are having. So this video really opened people's eyes to <coughs> what, people, what patients are going through and gave them lots and lots of ideas um, the post-its here are their ideas about innovations they might introduce in the emergency room. They went beyond ideas. They actually built stuff. It's hard to tell what this is, but the blue thing is a rear-view mirror strapped onto a gurney so that the patients can make eye contact with the people who are wheeling them around instead of craning their neck or not knowing. Um, and they also introduced erasable whiteboards into the patient rooms so that they could personalize their space while they were staying and, and get messages, messages from visitors and, and from staff. What was really great about this project was it really changed the culture by involving everybody in this research experience and the, the innovations. Now the hospital, every time they have a good idea, every time they have an idea, they prototype it. And this nurse, it, it, she took this picture because she was so excited. She's just back from Home Depot. She bought the cart and the cooler, and she's made a mobile blood sampling unit. So she can run around to all the patients taking samples rather than have them transported to her. So it really... You know, it's great. It was a great. It made a great impact on the people who got really excited about this. And to, for the future, um, I've, you know, the three stories I've just told, in all of them, the research played a really important, important role. But um, in all cases, again, it was about this blending between the rational and intuitive thinking. It wasn't just a rational understanding of the people. It involved empathy, it involved imagination. For Graham, it was empathy with the children that, that um, inspired his idea. And for the bank, the service providers themselves really made an empathic connection with their consumers. With the hospital, it was everybody, all the staff, technicians, administrators too. But for the future, what if instead of that level of understanding being just about the consumer, what if it extended to all the players in that system? That, that's one thought about what kind of innovation would that give rise to? And beyond that even, outside of the hospital, what about the extended network, the entire business ecology? What about the pharmacists, the insurers, the people who put up the buildings, the, the suppliers of equipment in China and Europe, the people in the call centers in India? What if that kind of empathic understanding and inspiration could happen at that level. Just imagine the sort, of in, the sort of inspired innovation that could come about. And so for me, that's where I'm interested in going next, into exploring this realm. I, I'm calling it the empathic economy. Um, I hope that I'll get to come back here soon and tell some new stories about uh, continuing to redefine research for innovation. Thanks. <laughs>